need Frolov is uh, our uh, senior engineer, super expert uh, of con superconducting cubic characterization and measurement. So everything you see now basically was developed by him. Uh, so he will show you this laboratory and also we'll, uh, we'll make you a live uh, demo of how we make the measurements. Okay, so yeah. do, do you see the screen? You can go then. Okay, so what so is it F, F5, right? What's the name of this button? Uh, okay, so let's start. So basically what we are working with, as you have already heard, are uh, Josephson junctions. Superconducting uh, quantum computing is based on Josephson junction. Just one slide about Josephson junction. So it was just a piece of uh, two superconductors separated by an insulator. And from engineering point of view, uh, it's interesting. It has an interesting feature that um, it has an inductance that can be nonlinear. And um, this inductance LJ depends on uh, this uh, critical current and superconducting phase between two superconductors. And from engineering point of view, to measure the properties of the superconducting qubits, one needs to know critical current, uh, Josephson inductance, and the capacitance between these uh, uh, two superconductors. Salvatore, can you reduce the sound a little bit? Otherwise, <laughs> it's hard to concentrate. Yeah, yeah OK. So next, uh, and uh, so we can control critical current in Josephson ju junction by changing the sizes of the junctions. And uh, we can measure it directly by measuring the room temperature of the Josephson junction. And from using the simple uh, formulas, we can extract Josephson inductance. For transpond qubit, uh, we can estimate resonance frequency from simulation of capacitance coupled to the Josephson junction and the Josephson inductance. And the, this is example of setup of how room temperature uh, resistance of Josephson junction is measured. And I will show you later in more detail. And uh, so when super when Josephson junction is coupled to a, um, uh, an LC classical LC circuits, we can get a, a electrical circuit that has quantum mechanical properties. And on the left, you see this uh, very well known pictures of uh, 2D qubits which are basically Josephson junction coupled to a microstrip transmission line. And on the right side, you see um, Josephson junction coupled to 3D cavities. And I know that you have already been told about 3D qubits and 3D transmons, but this is just slide to uh, uh, explain that everything can be described in the end as, a, as a, an equivalent circuit of an LC circuit to which this uh, Josephson junction is coupled. And the idea is that uh, these two circuits uh, have their own resonant frequencies. And by exciting them with uh, RF pulses, you can uh, program basically and read the state of the superconducting qubits. Uh, and uh, one of the features of Fermilab is that we have uh, expertise in superconducting cavities and we can manufacture uh, cavities with a record high quality factors and uh, the main goal of our center is to develop uh, materials and build new uh, qubits that will have record high uh, lifetime approaching se several seconds uh, and again just to remind you, I will be show, showing the dilution fridge here. So why do we need to cool uh, down to very low temperatures? It's simply because the, uh, for, um, 
frequencies around five gigahertz that our qubits operate at. Uh, the temperature of the half photon noise is around uh, is around uh, 240 millikelvin, and we want to be order of magnitude less than that, and that's why we need to cool to millikelvins. And also, uh, of course, one can design a network that will operate at 50 gigahertz. But it turns out that cool down to such temp low temperature of millikelvins is much easier than work with circuits that operates that, that operate at tens of gigahertz. And uh, this is uh, the um, layout of uh, our um, dilution fridge. And basically, we have uh, five devices here. Um, so these devices are superconducting cavities. Some of these cavities contain uh, qubits in them, and I will show you later. And these are, uh, uh, this is a 2D device from NIST. And all this chain of uh, filters, uh, attenuators, and uh, transmission lines, including superconducting transmission lines, allow us to uh, generate uh, various states in qubits and read, down, read them out by, uh, by uh, microwave uh, pulses. Um, so for example, here, you can switch between five devices and you can select different uh, amplifiers, quantum limited amplifiers, conventional amplifiers, different frequency ranges. So in general, this setup can operate from 600 megahertz to 12 gigahertz and characterize various devices in this range. And it also has uh, effective noise temperature uh, down to uh, single, single photons effectively. So, and then I, as I mentioned, everything is done by means of uh, RF and microwave electronics. So in order to um, read a single qubit, very simple uh, uh, device that has just a qubit coupled to um, LC circuit, you need to have at least um, two signal generators. One signal generator should be tuned at the frequency of the LC circuit. Another signal generator should be tuned at the frequency of the qubit. So you mod modulate these signal generators with an arbitrary waveform generator, and then you combine the signals, send them to the qubit. And then you read out the output signal uh, by amplifying it. And uh, you use a super heterogeneous technique to extract the readout signal from noise uh, down converted back to the um, intermediate frequency, then digitize. And then uh, you can uh, uh, actually see on the, on the screen the, this uh, so-called uh, blob uh, charts or blobs in, in IQ space that you have previously been uh, told about in, in the in the lecture. Okay, now let's uh, switch to the tour. So I will stop share the screen. And uh, okay, so let me maybe oh, let Salvatore probably show everything. So what you see here on, on right now is our test bench where we debug different type of electronics. So uh, this is our lab. So it has two fridges. One is standing over over there, and uh, it has uh, two racks of electronics. So on the left you see the RF electronics, and on the right you see the uh, rack with uh, electronics that controls fridge and temperature. And but this will be the second one that I will show. First, I will I will show you the um, the uh, old the old fridge. So let's let us. Um, Disconnect this computer. Salvatore, can you go here? So this is a collection of electronics, very sophisticated and expensive microwave equipment that uh, allows to control um, a single qubit but it, it is designed in a such way that it can ultimately produce any type of uh, any type of signals in in with a very wide uh, bandwidth and any type of uh, modulation analog uh, digital modulation frequency phase 
amplitude modulation, and in wide in wide frequency range. So uh, let me take the pointer. So here we have an uh, AWG uh, PXI AWG uh, generator that produces the waveforms IF frequency signals in the baseband. So then here we have set of uh, three uh, generators that generate, uh, this generates qubit signals, this generates the readout signal, this generates signals required for quantum memory. We have another uh, arbitrary waveform generator here that allows to generate waveforms even with more uh, bandwidth. Also, some oscillators to uh, to um, feed uh, quantum limited amplifier and uh, network analyzers, spectrum analyzers. Also, we have this uh, dual channel uh, um, super heterogeneous uh, receiver that operates in range from two to eighteen gigahertz and has uh, it's it's in house built. It has dynamic range of about uh, one hundred thirty dB, so can detect very weak signals and uh, also here there is some electronics that is used to control uh, to measure um, to measure uh, uh, magnetic field in the qubits so now let's go sl very slowly salvador we'll move to the actually to the fridge and uh, at, at the moment there are, there are no devices installed here because we removed them but basically these electronics so there you see there is this bunch of RF cables that go and feed the fridge. And then in the fridge, it's inside. Uh, there are these uh, plates. So th this is cooled to uh, 4 Kelvin. Then um, I have uh, quasi 4 Kelvin, quasi 4 Kel Kelvin plate, steel uh, plate, mixing chamber plate. And there, so this is cooled down to 20 milli Kelvin. And usually the device is mounted here. Then we have here a bunch of uh, microwave cryogenic switches and also um, uh, quantum limited amplifiers, circulators, uh, magnetometers, uh, superconducting wires, all kind of electronics, uh, cryoelectronics that is needed to read out the states of the qubits. And uh, then <clears throat> here I would like to show you the uh, actually the uh, setup that we use to measure room temperature resistance of the qubits. So this is a conventional, I mean, room temperature uh, pro probe station that uh, has a microscope and two probes. And uh, actually the qubit itself for us, for superconducting cavities looks like, uh, so we have don't worry, this is broken already. So this is just a piece of silicon with deposited uh, qubit with two antennas on it. I, you may, maybe don't see it on the on the right now, but I will show it in the microscope. So basically, what we do, we have these cavities. This is nine gigahertz cavities, and we insert using special fixture this qubit in, inside of the cavity, and then uh, couple it to the cavity modes. So this is basically the idea, and uh, so. Here is on the screen, you can see this magnified. So the Josephson junction is here in, in the center and I can zoom in. Um, and these are just two antennas here and here. So these needles are uh, actually DC probes to measure room temperature resistance. And let me uh, zoom a little bit. So. Yeah, so we will not see the Josephson junction itself, but you can get an idea of uh, how small it is comparing to, uh, to antennas. So it's, it's located somewhere somewhere in here. Um, then, <clears throat> so the, this instrumentation, all this uh, LCR meter and uh, is required to measure uh, them with very low, uh, specifically this instrument with very low voltage bias, about uh, 20, yeah, it's, it's here, yeah, about 20 uh, millivolts. And this is required to protect uh, Judas and Junction from static discharge. 
So then let's move to another fridge. Uh, second. <coughs> so let's move to another fridge. Yeah, this is this is brand new <laughs> fridge, and uh, one unique device that we have here is this. Uh, this is actually aluminum cavity, but this is very unusual because normally, so over there, you can see th this cavity is uh, niobium, and this is a 1.3 gigahertz Tesla-shaped uh, cavity developed for particle acceleration. So this cavity here is probably one of a kind uh, of such shape aluminum cavity that we plan to cool down and do material studies with this. And you see it has already installed uh, temp temperature sensors, especially there is temperature sensor over here, temperature sensor here. And then uh, this is used for a uh, magnetometer and it's on a separate uh, uh, copper rod because it needs to be uh, heated to four Kelvin, it can, cannot operate at, at millikelvin temperatures. And then another interesting thing here is uh, the uh, so this is this is a qubit here in inside of a magnetic shield qubit from NIST. And we since this, this will be soon there will be the first like, commissioning cooldown of this fridge. We will use this qubit to debug all the electronics and uh, to uh, to increase our number of tests here, because it usually it's one run takes usually a couple months to, to finish. Uh, so then, uh, by the way, any questions? No questions. Okay. <laughs> then I will maybe go to the um, another computer. If you don't have any questions, I will show you some pulse generation. <clears throat> uh, okay, I need to uh, share screen with from another computer, which is called TD SRV Quantum. Can I do it? I am not sure, but let me. Yeah, can can you make co-host uh, the machine with the name TD SRV Quantum? Okay. Yes, I did it. Uh, I don't know if uh, you can share now. Then you yeah, I I'll try. Okay. So, do you see actually this window? Yes, we. Do you, I mean, can you can you read what is shown here, or is it is it good enough? You were moving away a coherent control required to manipulate quantum states. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so basically you were all, uh, uh, expl they explained to you that uh, uh, creating this superposition of two states requires uh, evolution along the surface of the sphere. And um, in superconducting qubits, it's achieved using a microwave drive and uh, basically two um, main uh, parameters that that can uh, the figures of merit of superconducting qubits is t1 lifetime and t2 uh, uh, decoherence time and uh, so i will try to show you not in the in the real qubit because we are now warm the fridge is warm but in general in from the electronics point of view how these pulses are created so again, um, just to, to show you in more detail. So this is, uh, uh, it, this is not full schematic, but it shows the main idea behind this type of measurement. So both um, um, readout resonator and the qubit resonator uh, require to have uh, 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 microwave pulses in order to control them. And for readout resonator, microwave pulse should not be uh, comparable to the lifetime uh, T1 of the qubit. So in our case, uh, 
uh, readout pulse is around one or two microseconds. And for qubit, uh, it's also depend on the rate of Rabi oscillations that you want to achieve, but you can in general control the uh, magnitude and the, the uh, pulse length of the qubit pulse. So in our case, it's about 100 nanoseconds for qubit. And uh, so we have these two generators that I showed you before, and we have an arbitrary waveform generator and we use these are vector signal generators so inside they have a uh, up converter uh, full featured uh, in, in phase in, in in quadrature uh, up converter that allows you to convert any signal that comes in uh, into the uh, upper sideband or lower sideband and sub substantially suppress the carrier frequency so basically you can set these two generators to the frequencies that you uh, uh, found during uh, the spectroscopy measurements of the qubit and resonator and accordingly set their magnitudes and then uh, send these pulses and these pulses will be generated at low frequency basically and the pulses that come out here will be uh, microwave pulses so then you combine them in one single transmission line and send through this chain of attenuators to the to the qubit in order to suppress the um, uh, room temperature noise. And then when one of the pulses, the readout uh, pulse, which is usually much, much weaker than the qubit pulse, uh, when it comes out from the readout resonator, it is amplified by the chain of amplifiers. So there is not only single amplifier, there are usually at least one, uh, one cryogenic amplifier, sometimes quantum limited amplifier, and then at least uh, one or two room temperature amplifiers. So totally this amplification chain has at least 100 dB of gain. And then it go gets into this um, uh, down converter. So physicists sometimes uh, call it uh, uh, microwave interferometer, which is true more or less, but in general, this is uh, nothing uh, special. It's uh, each cell phone contains such uh, demodulator inside. Uh, basically, um, uh, this very weak signal is down converted using local oscillator. Sometimes it can be a separate local oscillator, but sometimes it can be the, the same uh, local oscillator that was used to uh, synthesize the signal over here, and it's more desirable in this case because it's phase coherent. Um, and then it has also a reference channel to which we send the readout signal that just bypasses the qubit and doesn't uh, go anywhere else. And then we compare these two signals uh, in magnitude and phase, um, basically, and then extract uh, in phase, in quadrature informa information in uh, Cartesian or magnitude and phase in polar coordinates. And I <clears throat> should say that if one could generate signals directly using some fancy AWG at microwave frequencies and then digitize the signals also directly, then one would not need all this uh, all this intermediate chains. So this is made only because it is hard to operate with microwave signals uh, directly. And then, so I will show you j here just the um, so T1 measurement. So when T1 uh, when we do T1 measurement, we apply a, a pulse that excites the qubit and uh, moves this vector into this point. And then, um, and then you measure basically how long it will take to go back here, to go back to ground state. So this is this is one of the example of the control software from Keysight, which is called Labber. Uh, and basically, so here there are two uh, measurement uh, uh, setups. So one will measure T1, and this is here you can see the scope, oscilloscope, which actually shows the signals that are sent. These are directly digitized microwave signals 
that are sent to the will be sent to the qubit, and this is the trigger uh, pulse. Uh, so this magenta long pulse is actually readout pulse. You can see that it's about 2.5 microseconds long. And when, when I start uh, this um, T1 measurement, then you see here appeared a second pulse, which is the qubit pulse. And you see this pulse goes further and further away, which basically means that you excite the qubit, then you wait some time, and then you measure the state. And I should uh, point out specifically that the, each measurement is repeated here at least 5,000 times uh, for this specific setup, because we are not using quantum limited amplifier. So we generate this pulse, we wait, then we generate readout pulse, then repeat this experiment 5,000 times, and then move it further and further and further. And then from these 5,000 measurements of uh, of this uh, readout pulse, we can extract enough statistics to uh, to see if the qubit is in the uh, ground or 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 uh, excited state. And uh, here is the result that you get in the end, basically. So and these are very arbitrary units. So this is just some voltage of the readout pulse on the vertical scale. And on the horizontal scale, this is time in nanosecond, actually the delay between this qubit pulse and the readout pulse. And uh, each point uh, here consists from uh, these thousands of averages. So each point requires thousands of averages, but because the repetition rate of the experiment is quite fast, it doesn't take super long time to collect this amount of averages. And so, then if you if you feed this so this basically corresponds to um, excited state somewhere here to, to ground state so if you then do a fit you will see that for our for this specific qubit the lifetime was around uh, i guess 40 40 microseconds so this is t1 then uh, there is another example uh, and i will stop this thing this is T2 measurement. So in T2 measurement, um, as you know, uh, we we are applying a half pi pulse, which uh, causes the um, this vector go into the uh, center of the sphere and uh, be in some you know some arbitrary superposition of states. On the on the radius of this sphere, and so and then we send the second pi over two pulse, which uh, depending on the condition of where it is on on the radius, it will switch it either to um, one or to uh, zero state, and uh, so this is how it's done. Again, uh, this is all only uh, all about just programming. Uh, AWGs and creating pulse sequences. So basically, so here you now can see two pulses. This pulse switches it to the equator the, on the block sphere, and this resets back. And the time that is between these pulses is the actually the horizontal scale on the resulting T2 measurement. So for T2 measurement, you see this oscillating sine wave, uh, which, which oscillates with frequency uh, equal to the detuning between the resonant frequency of the qubit and the resonant frequency of this uh, pi over two pulse. And it is done intentionally because it is easier to fit uh, when you have some, when, instead of just exponential, you have some sine wave that decays exponentially. Uh, and th this is also a very, uh, very accurate way to measure actually the, the frequency of uh, the qubit. And uh, so again, it oscillates between uh, ground and excited state. So there are, there are other type of measurements like spin echo where you have uh, um, 
three pulses here, but and you can read uh, about that also. Maybe you have already been told about that, but I just don't have example right now. So this is basically uh, all I wanted to tell about, and I'm even surprised that I have 15 minutes left. <laughs> I thought it will take longer. <laughs> so any questions? Maybe we can look into some other measurements if you like. Yeah, there is a question uh -huh. on the shielding. Oh, uh, uh, I, so, so it's in the chat. Abdella, right? If you want, you can unmute and speak. Yes, if you could say a few words about the shielding and the noise level. Um, and also uh, the temperature, you said it goes down to 20 millikelvin. Yes. I'm not sure if you could uh, push that down a little bit to 15 or... Yeah. So the thing is that the, the actually the this fridge is specified for. Um, yeah, let me maybe stop sharing and uh, I can share the electrical schematics of the fridge. Um, so actually. Yeah, this is it. So the, the fridge is rated for uh, eight millikelvins actually. And the cooling power of this fridge is about, uh, at the mixing chamber, I think it's about 30 microwatts. So it all depends on uh, what's amount of uh, the devices that you want to put there. And uh, ultimately, uh, I mean, on average, Depending on how hard you drive the your cavities, how much RF power do you send there, the temperature is around 19 or 20 millikelvin. But if you turn off everything and let it cool, I think it will cool down maybe to 12 millikelvin. And if you remove uh, some devices uh, and reduce the heat load, it can cool down to 8 millikelvin. So in our case, we normally operate from um, I would say, as you said, from 15, maybe 14, and up to 20, 25 millikelvin. Okay. Uh, and what was the second question? I forgot. Uh, the noise. I know in these experiments, the noise is a nightmare. Um, do you shield the, the, um, the refrigerator? Are you located in underground or, you know, just mechanical uh, so, vibrations and that? Yeah, the, Okay, yeah, this is this depends actually on what type of noise we are talking about. So if we talk about magnetic noise, then yes, we have to shield uh, the fridge uh, with an external. So you, you have seen in the, I, I have show, shown you the um, uh, sh magnetic shielding for one qubit. So what we also do, we have an uh, external shielding around the fridge from uh, uh, mu metal. And uh, so, so we protected that way from the earth magnetic field. And we have magnetometers inside that constantly monitor this field. And we use as well as qubits to measure the magnetic field down to single flux quanta uh, levels. But also we use commercial magnetometers to, uh, as a reference. Then uh, regarding the... Um, uh, uh, electrical noise. So the thing is that here, um, first of all, the room temperature noise is suppressed by this chain of the attenuators. And uh, the amount of the attenuation should be enough to suppress the room temperature noise. But at the same time, it should not be too high. Otherwise, it will reduce single to noise uh, ratio. And also, the, um, we also need to take into account the uh, cooling ca capabilities of these plates. So obviously, you cannot put one big attenuator at the mixing chamber. And so you need to distribute this attenuation between plates, because at each temperature, there is some minimum uh, noise floor below which you cannot go by adding attenuators just because of it has higher temperature. And then also here, we have uh, these so-called echo sorb filters. 
which is basically a transmission line filled with an, a, a, with a special type of um, epoxy that absorbs um, my, my, I mean, microwave and infrared radiation, and the absorption goes increases with frequency. So this is how you shield it from the infrared uh, noise. And also here, uh, there is a bunch of these uh, uh, isolators, because imagine that your qubit is, um, so your qubit is somewhere here, right? And you, you suppress the noise that comes from the um, room temperature, even at, at millikelvin, uh, sorry, even at four Kelvin stages. You, so you suppress all this noise using attenuators. But on the output uh, chain, you have this uh, high electron mobility transistor uh, microwave amplifiers that can operate only at four or about maybe one or two Kelvins, but not lower than that. And they, uh, by themselves, they, gen they generate um, uh, noise, thermal noise. And this noise can leak back uh, into the qubits and cause uh, problems. But you cannot put attenuators here. So instead, you put an isolators and you cool the isolators to the uh, millikelvin temperatures. So, uh, so the signal goes only in one direction and the noise doesn't go uh, back backwards. Um, so yeah, so this is and of course there is there are there is uh, uh, a lot of temperature uh, shielding inside of the fridge, but it's provided by the manufacturer. Also, there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting things about grounding of the fridge. So RF lines, we try to uh, DC bias them from uh, uh, from the electronic building ground in order not to create ground loops. But this is, uh, so there are a lot of papers that, you know, people try to ensure that everything is as best as possible, but there is there are not too many systematic studies that explicitly prove that this type of grounding or this type of uh, uh, filter for this specific qubit helps so it's all like an open research area. Is this answer your question? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, uh, OK. So yeah, there is, looks like there is no, no other questions. If not. Daniel, maybe we can see your face. Oh, uh, <laughs> my face. Yeah, uh, let me let me try to to do it. There are three three different cameras connected. So sorry. Uh, do you see it now? Yeah, you go. Okay. Yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so, is there any other question? <clears throat> ah, this one. Oh. SQMS. Oh, I think this is a great question for Sylvia because she is in charge of <laughs> these internships. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. I, I cannot hear you, Kevin, so we'll just read your question. So about the quantum undergraduate internship program, we plan to have it every year. Um, in that case, if it is possible to work in this field, and it, I don't understand what you mean by that. Yeah, so basically, you know, the, the undergraduate in the internship program is a way that we, we use to get to know uh, the undergraduate population and, you know, also to, uh, to have a possibility to grow the next generation of uh, engineers and science and scientists in, uh, in the quantum in this field. So basically, you know, it's a great opportunity for the undergraduates because they can, uh, um, if, if they get to know us, then perhaps they can be supported with the uh, um, uh, other, other graduate position later or a fellow post postgraduate fellowship later on. 
You're welcome. Okay, if there is no other question, then thank you, Daniel, again.